River Plate and Boca Juniors are Argentina's two most successful clubs. River Plate have the edge in Argentinian titles with 36 to Boca's 32, but Boca have the edge in the Copa Libertadores with 7 to River's 4. In the 1940s, River had the edge, and although they lost this particular match to their great rivals, the style of football that River Plate played in the 1940s was extraordinarily pure, but often indecisive. Known as La Maquina, they hogged possession and took their time in scoring goals. Because of this, they became known as the Knights of Anguish. Because of their habit of dominating games without scoring winning goals, in this game, Boca scored four to Rivers one, but it was River Plate that developed the young Alfredo Di Stefano. Throughout the 1940s, Torino played mesmerizing attacking football winning four consecutive league titles and scoring the most Serie A goals in a season. 125 in 40 matches in 1947-48. In fact, the three best goal-scoring averages in the history of the game all belong to Torino. In one match in 1946, played in the Stadio Olimpico in Rome, Torino hit six unanswered goals within 19 minutes and at halftime, their manager, Luigi Ferrero, instructed his players to take it easy as the job was done. However, the legend of that great Torino side ended tragically in the Super GA air crash of 1949 which claimed the lives of all 31 people on board. The attacking excellence of the 1940s Torino team, however, will never be forgotten. British influence in Brazilian football had remained strong far longer than it had in Uruguay or Argentina, but the game was still focused more on individual self-expression than on team play. In 1950, after a 12-year break due to the Second World War, the World Cup came to Brazil. There was a four-team group in place of the semi-finals and final. Brazil beat Sweden and Spain 7-1 and 6-1 respectively. Uruguay had managed to beat Sweden 3-2 but were held by Spain 2-2. Therefore, Brazil needed to secure a draw to lift the trophy for the first time. When those results were compared, it seemed that the Brazilians were set to defeat Uruguay as easily as they had dispensed with Spain and Sweden. In the Copa America, also held in Brazil the previous year, the hosts won by scoring 46 goals in 8 matches. Runners-up Paraguay were beaten 7-0, Uruguay were dispatched 5-1. Therefore, when Friaca put them up 1-0 just after half-time, the stage was set for an almighty party. 22 gold medals had been made with each player's name imprinted on them and the mayor of Rio delivered the words, you, players who in less than a few hours will be hailed as champions by millions of compatriots, you who have no rivals in the entire hemisphere, you who will overcome any other competitor, you who I already salute as victors. A victory song, Brazil the Victors, was composed and practiced ready to be played after the final. The actual stadium attendance is estimated to be over 200,000 and during the day an improvised carnival was organized with thousands of signs celebrating the world title. What transpired was one of the biggest upsets in football history. After Uruguay v Argentina in 1930, the 1950 World Cup final match was the second time that two South American teams had competed for the trophy. Gigia was the last surviving player from the game. He died on 16th of July 2015 at the age of 88, exactly 65 years after scoring the decisive goal. Thank you.
Cecilia con Corojito. Avanza Chico, perseguido por Gambetta. Lo anula, se va a ir, se va a tirar. Se va a la pelota al corner contra Uruguay. Y repito que estamos sobre la hora del término del partido. meets the boys from Blackpool at Wembley before their cup final battle with Bolton Wanderers. From the Royal Box, Her Majesty the Queen watches the Duke shake hands with the white-shirted Wanderers who are making their fourth appearance at Wembley. Here are goalkeeper Stanley Hansen and Bolton's inside left Harold Hassel ready and waiting for the great kickoff. Princess Margaret takes her seat and Blackpool facing a slight headwind kickoff. Right away, Blackpool are on the attack, but a Bolton player gets to it and tries to swing play back to the other end. Now Bolton get going smoothly. Hassel collects and passes. The ball goes to Nat Lofthouse. He shoots. Farm fumbles, and it's a goal. Bolton have drawn first blood within 90 seconds. Bolton keep up the pressure, and Blackpool defence seem far from confident now. But Shimwell gets it clear of the goal and manages to force a way through the attackers. Blackpool back, Garrett sends it up to Lofthouse, who shoots, but it hits the upright. In comes Bill Moyer, but he too cannot penetrate the defence. Moyer, Fenton and Gurley Farm scramble for it, but Fenton gets it out of danger. Blackpool swing into action again and are soon down by the Bolton goal. Stan Morrison has a slam. And in it goes. Blackpool have got the equaliser. Now Stanley Matthews takes over. He passes, but there's no goal this time, as goalie Hansen clears it away and starts a Bolton counter-attack. Eric Bell, who injured his leg earlier on, gallantly struggles after it and manages to pass it back to Langton. Langton shoots, but Farm makes a good save, and Blackpool breathe again. Bolton have looked the better team right the way through the first half. In the Blackpool girl, Farm faces a shot from Langton. He and Lofthouse miss, and there's another one. Bolton are two, Blackpool still one. Into the second half, and Blackpool begin to show some of the skill we expect of them. Stan Matthews is after it, and off he goes with a dazzling display that proves he's as good as ever he was. As he centers, Mortensen gets out of the way to let Perry shoot, but it's wider than net. Now the Wanderers get their forward machine moving again. From the right wing, Douglas Holden centers, and despite his injury, Eric Bell heads it in for Bolton's third goal. 3-1, looks all over for Blackpool. As unworried as ever, Matthew sends over a beautifully placed center. Goalkeeper Hanson tries to check it, but Stan Mortensen forces it in. Bolton 3, Blackpool 2. Mortensen's hurt his right leg, but wild horses couldn't keep him off the pitch at this stage of the game. Douglas Holden leads the Wanderers on an offensive. Up near the goal mouth, Lofthouse gets on with the good work. Lofthouse centers, but Goalie Farm is there to deal with the situation this time. His clearance upfield sets his teammates on another attack. There's a foul. 
one of the players took quite a knock, and the ref awards Blackpool a free kick. Mortensen takes it. Wham! He's done it. It's in. Blackpool and Bolton are on even terms with three goals apiece. Matthews again, giving the game everything he's got. In the Bolton goal, Hansen gets ready for work. The great little wizard has it again. A flick to centre finds Perry, who crashes it home into the Bolton net. Blackpool four, Bolton three. There's no doubt about it now. Matthews, recently ignored by the England selectors, is the man of the match. What a great reception he gets from all at Wembley as the whistle goes. Matthews, in his third cup final, is the hero of the day. Her Majesty the Queen rises to greet the two teams and to award the cup. And here come the winners, gallant Blackpool, who turned what seemed defeat into one of the most dramatic victories ever seen at Wembley. Their captain, Harry Johnston, receives the most coveted football trophy of them all. A royal congratulation for Stanley Matthews and a winner's medal at long last are fitting rewards for the most dazzling sportsman in world soccer. Queen waves a last farewell to the crowds as Harry Johnston and Stanley Matthews take the cup to Blackpool. And there is number five, but he's not the centre half. And now a chance for Hidden Guti. It's a goal! Beautiful pass to Mortensen, who's got a clear run to Saul. It must be a goal. Must be a goal. What a bad kick by Mary. Seaball cutting in the outside left. Back to Pushkas. It's a goal! Hidakuti. Twenty minutes play, Hungary two, England one. Hidakuti scoring both goals for Hungary, Seoul scoring for England. Whether that ball would have gone into the net if Vilek as they hadn't been there, I don't know. Is Budai a chance for him? Pushkas, the Hungarian skipper. There's the outside left sea ball right over on the right wing. Oh, a lovely goal! <laughs> 24 minutes, Hungary 3, England 1. And that was Pushkas, the inside left and captain, who scored that one. And my goodness, if he can turn on tricks like this, we ought to have him on the music hall. And Mr. Horn, the, uh, the Dutch referee, given a free kick against Bill Eckersley. Mr. Horn was the referee here last year when England beat Belgium by five goals to nil. And it's the right half, Botschik, going to take the kick. It's a goal, my goodness! And let's see what Stanley can do. He, he's not been able to do anything at all in this match yet. George Robert, and a wonderful save. Stan Matthews with the corner. Mortensen, who's got a clear run. It's a goal! Uh, number five, don't think that's the centre half. That's 
Botsik, the right half. Pushkas. And Kotchis hit the post. Botchik, it's a goal! Let's play basketball, this Hungarian side. Pushkas. Hit a goodie, it's a goal! Fifty-five minutes gone. England two, Hungary six. He was a very great amateur player, an amateur international. That's where he met the Hungarians. Oh dear me! It must be a penalty. Penalty. Now then. Well, must be Alf Ramsey. Here he comes. Hungarians appear to have decided it's time and there is the whistle it's all over England 3 Hungary 6 England 3 Hungary 6